it's not. So you feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, yeah. Like, there's only two like, uh, Yeah, you can basically interrupt me anytime and I'm okay with it. It's too much. <laughs> it's fine. Wait, where's the QRP slide? Where's the QRP yes, slide? it's the last one. It's the last one. It's here. Okay, but on the full, it's like you have a break in between, right? Like you, have, you have a halfway break. <laughs> we could have halfway break. Yeah. yeah, let's do a halfway break instead. Let me, let me show that halfway break. We don't show it now. Long. Okay, you can show it now. Like this. I'm, I'm going to, when you show it, I'm going to take a picture. Take a photo. Yeah. Okay, then I guess you can just do it now. Right? Do it now. No, no, no. Halfway show it. Oh, I'll do you guys. Just quick. But if you take a photo, you can ask me to pose a better. I think this point. I think we're doing a candid. This point will have to be fair. When you take a photo, tell me so I can look like oh, fancy. Like this is a wonderful. Okay, we'll get started, I guess, now. Um, so for th those of you that came in a bit late, here's the link to the slides. Uh, please go to this link. If you can't access the slides, please let me know. I think you should be able to. Um, hopefully you have taken this link down. Okay, so we're going to talk about data bases today. And uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Devansh. I'm in year three studying CS. I'm part of NUS Hackers. Um, and today we're going to be talking about what are databases. And we're going to focus on relational data uh, data basis most of the time. Um, and we're going to focus a bit more on how do you design your own, your own database in the sense that when you're given a, a problem, it's quite hard to come up with a database structure. So that also we'll spend quite a fair bit of time on. And then we'll actually do a hands-on thing where we write SQL code to solve a real world problem. So let's get started. Before that, I hope everyone has installed this by now. Um, um, so if you have not, now is a good time to do so. Um, so if you have the slides, these links are also on the slides. Please download it. We'll be using both of these for the later half of the workshop. Um, so Postgres is just a relational database management tool. Now these words might sound complicated now, but hopefully by the end, you will know exactly uh, what they mean. PG admin is a way to interact with Postgres. Most people don't like to use the terminal because it might seem a bit daunting. So there's a graphical interface to interact with it, to write queries and um, so on, right? Um, so the first question that you should ask yourself when you learn a new tool is, why do we need it in the first place? And 
the reason we need databases is that we want to save data that we have to a disk or to some piece of hardware where that even if the machine dies or the battery dies, you can still access it. So we want to do this, but that's not all because then we could just use a file. But we also want to be able to work with this data efficiently. So the key point here is that we want to be able to load and store data, to manipulate data, to search for things very efficiently. Um, and that's why files are not great, because files are fine if you just want to store information. But if you wanted to use this data to sort of like extract some things or to perform computation with it, it's much more difficult. Like imagine you have, say, um, who are in charge of NUS infrastructure, and, and you have 30,000 students. It's very hard to think about how you are going to organize this information in the form of um, files, right? Like you could argue that you could have a file per student. Um, you could say then, how do you know which student is, is in which year or which courses the student is taking, um, so on. Things like that get very hard to scale up. So the whole point of a database is to organize data in, in, in a way that relates to the real world. So we're trying to map the real world to software. So I think that's what you should keep in your mind as to why do we care about these things. Um, there are many kinds of databases that, that exist. Not all of them use the same ideas that we'll talk about today. Today, we're going to be talking mostly about databases that use tables, which is rows and columns. There are many that don't use this, they're document based, so there's no particular stru uh, structure to them. Sometimes those ones perform uh, faster than these. Uh, most of the times, they don't. Um, and this is why we're talking about relational data basis is because like the top five are all the ones that we're going to be talking about today. The document base is like the fifth one, right? So, so then even in today's world, we are still living in a relational world. Um, and just to simplify things so that you're not daunted by terms, a relational da database is just a collection of tables. And a table <coughs> has rows and columns. The rows are generally called tuples, and the columns are called fields or attributes. So I'll use all of them interchangeably just so you can get the hang of it, because many people use different things um, because they all mean the same thing. Um, and this is important because this gives you a way to structure data is that every column has the same kind of data. So say you have a table for students, you would have one field be name, say. So that field would just have strings. Um, strings are just text, basically text. And you might have another field called cap. And your cap might be an integer or a floating point. right? Um, but the point being is that in that entire column of data, they all should have the same type. You can't have one row storing cap to be a string and another being it a floating point. A floating point is just a number with a decimal point. Um, and again, the main aim, which is what you should take away from this, is our goal is to model the real world in the form of tables. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, so for example, the, the goal is to store information about students. You could store, say, just three things, first name, last name, and the date of birth, right? And this is how it would look like. Um, and this basically means these are the columns that we'll be storing, which is first name, last name, the date of birth. There is an additional column at the top, which is student ID. That's needed because you need some way to differentiate 
people who have the same name and date of birth. So that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. So you notice there's this key thing here, and that's because that column is called a primary key. Uh, the primary key is just a thing that uniquely identifies every row in a table. Um, that's all there is to it, which means that given a student number, you know everything about the student. So you know the first name, last name, the date of birth. Does that make sense? So the point is that if we don't have this, then it's possible to have two Devan Shahs born on the same day that happen to come to NUS and then the database doesn't know which one is which. So we are trying to map two different people in the real world to two different um, rows. So we need some attribute that identifies each of them, right? Hopefully this is all intuitive so far. <laughs> um, there are many kinds of things you can use as a primary key. You can use an ID. General things include ID, the email, phone number is arguable. Some countries might have duplicate phone numbers. Um, generally, what we do is if we can't find a natural candidate for the primary key, we just have a separate field called ID whose only purpose is to be the primary key. So here, the student ID is a very uncommon thing. Like humans don't have human ID associated with them. Right? The whole point of giving a person a number is not a natural thing to do from the perspective of the real world. But NUS and other institutions have to do it because that's the way that the software they use identifies them. Does that make sense? So, so, so my point is, um, you don't go up to someone and ask, so what is your human ID or your person ID because that's not how the real world operates but we want to map the real world to rows but it's possible for people to have the same attributes that we are storing so we need some way to discriminate between them and that's why we have this concept of a primary key. Now if this uh, sounds like I'm saying things for no reason it's not because the person that came up with this idea would have been questioned a lot as to the point of it. Uh, but now we use it and we take it for granted. Right? Um, okay, so now we move on to a slightly more nuanced example where we're trying to model the concept that we have students, now we have courses as well, and students take courses. Um, you can map this in many different ways. Uh, but the key idea that you should take away from this is that every entity here, which is the things in blue, has its own relation. Um, and this is because we want to keep things that are different in different tables. So a student is different from a course. So a student table and a course table will be different. Now again, that might seem obvious to you if you've if you worked with databases, but the point is that it's not so obvious when things get complicated, which we will come to. Um, the second point is important is that there's no model answer for me to give you. So if you come up with, an, with a database structure, it's possible that yours is equally as right as mine. Um, but there are definitely some very bad ways to do it, which I will come to, and some very good ways to do it as well. Um, side note here is that there is a way to quantify how good the structure is. Um, as computer science people, we don't like things that are vague, so we try to define things in a very formal way. So here I'm saying good way, bad way, but there are formal definitions of how good is a database, but that's beyond the scope of today. You can search it up. It's called normalization. The different forms as to how good a database is. But that's basically what the whole point of that is. Um, most people, when they learn about normali 
normalization. They think of it as a theoretical thing. It, it, it's not, it's a very pra practical thing to quantify how good your um, database design is. Um, so, okay, say here's my first thought on how I would design the database schema. So a schema is just a, a design of students take courses. So my claim is that this is sufficient to capture information because this has the top, um, okay, the, the, first, the first name, the last name, the date of birth captures information about a student. The last three fields capture, capture information about the course. Does this mean this is a good database uh, design? What do you guys think? Any thoughts on, is this a good design? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, so that's an issue. Um, so there are a lot of issues with this structure. Yes, so that's what we yeah. yeah. So the previous issue is that um, think about the fact that if you have a student um, who's so, okay, the first issue is that a student can, can only take a, a single course, but the bigger issue is that um, this relation does not distinguish between a student and a course. So it's possible, um, say there's a course that's not being taken by any student. That's possible, right? But this table won't store it because the primary key, it's a uh, student ID, which means that um, the course must be taken by some student for it to, to, to exist in the table. So if you don't have a student enrolled in a course, the course basically does not exist. But that's different from saying that there is a course, but the number of students taking it, that's zero. So now we're trying to split these tables into two. So the reason is that it's wrong because it's possible that if you make the columns that are not relevant now, we, then you will be wasting a lot of space because um, say you didn't even have the primary key constraint here, you could potentially store duplicate rows saying that student X takes this course, student Y takes this course, so on. But that's a lot of duplicate data being stored, and that's wasting space. So we want to do better now. So we try to split it into two tables that look something like this. Um, the first one is a courses table, which just stores the course information. The second one is a student uh, table that stores the student information. Um, do you think this is better? Any thoughts on here? Um, so just as a quick to make sure everyone knows, um, student ID integer means that the type of the column student ID is of type integer. Um, first name, so you see this character of varying means that it's a string of maximum length. Here it's 50, here it's 100, right? So it's basically saying, this is the maximum uh, length that a string can have. And again, a string is just plain text. Oh, okay, so does everyone think this is the right design? Or does anyone have any thoughts on this one? Okay, say we don't talk about that right now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, no, so so my question is not about which form it's in. It's just more of does this capture what we want to capture? So it's an intuitive kind of thing that I'm trying to get at. It's nothing uh, formal here. Yeah. Yes, right? So now you have courses, students, but you still don't know which students take which courses, right? So that's the key problem here is, yes, it's OK in the sense that you capture information, but we don't capture the fact that students take courses because we, tre we treated them as two distinct entities with no interaction between them. Uh, so now the question is, how do you model this relationship between the two tables? Do you have any ideas? They just have like a few other students, then like, course, like courses they can just fill in all the course IDs. Okay, so that's a great idea. Um, yeah? Okay, I'm not so sure that I follow that, but <laughs> okay, so we're not going to jump there so fast, but I first want to talk about that idea of just storing a list of courses taken by a student. That's a field in the student's table, right? I, I think that makes perfect sense. The issue is um, that's not a good design because you're storing multiple values in the same cell. So the issue with that is you can't check whether those values are valid or not. So it becomes, oh, okay, you can check, but it's harder to check whether the course values are valid or not because then you could type in any course ID that does not exist. So the key idea is that a single cell should only store a single piece of information. Did everyone get that? You don't want to store a list of things that are placed in a single cell because that's not what a database is good at. Databases are good if you store um, single things in single cells because then they can check the better this is a valid course or not. But that's a great thought because that's the first thing I thought of when I saw this as well. Um, so the point being is that, oh, oh wait, do, does anyone have any other ideas for this one? OK, so sort of the obvious thing that we want to do is that the only thing that we have learned so far is tables, right? So now we have a table for a student. We have a table for uh, courses. Now we just want a table to model the relationship between students taking the courses. So um, the whole thing that we're going to learn through this entire exercise is that everything in databases is going to be a table. You have, uh, you can have you can have a relationship being a table as well. So now you have a new table, student courses, where student ID course code simply means this student takes this course. Does that make sense? So this is a separate table. And now you might ask these arrows and stuff. Um, you can think of them as just representing the uh, relationship that means that this student ID must come from this uh, student ID here. So you can't have a student taking a course given that he's not in the student table. Same goes for a course. A course cannot be taken by a student when the course does not exist. Does that make sense? 
And uh, the really good thing about this is that Postgres will help us to check whether the input of the student ID and the course, I, uh, the course code is valid or not. So we get this guarantee that every student is a valid student and, and, and we also get that every course here is a valid course. So I think that's great because you don't have to manually check that. That's being done for you. Um, you probably don't appreciate this as much, but this means that your data here can never be wrong. You can't have a course here that does not exist. It's impossible. The database will throw an error when you try to do that. And that's great. Right? Um, okay, so now you notice two important things if you are um, excited to learn is you will notice, okay, so uh, a quick recap first. Student table stores information about each student. The courses table stores information about each course. Um, the student courses table stores information ab about the relationship between a student taking a course. Now we see that there are these things here. Um, and you notice that there's three of them and there's one of them there. This basically says that a, a, single, um, a single row here can have multiple values here. So this basically means that a student can appear multiple times in this table, which means that a student can take multiple courses. Same goes for the course code. This means that a course can be taken by multiple students. And that's what you want, because this will uniquely identify a student. The student ID field will um, tell you which student it is. But you don't want that to appear only one time, because that'll be quite Name if you can only take a single course. So does everyone get that? So this basically just means one student can take many, uh, one student can take many courses, and one course can be taken by many students. So you have the many on both the sides. Okay. Um, so and this field is called a foreign key because this uses the values that are in this table. So the student ID field in the student courses table um, references the values from the student ID field in the student ta table. So we'll get to that when we actually code it out. We'll see that we actually just use the word references and Postgres will make this um, link for us. Um, so there are many types of for foreign key relationships and this is probably not emphasized as much as it should because this determines how you structure your database design. So um, then um, you can argue that this is probably how you design a database when you are given constraints, right? You are given that say you have an example that one car can only have a single owner and you also have that one owner can only have one car. So it goes both ways. Say that's the rule, I'm not saying that, that it is. Um, then it's easy to model this, we will come to it. One to many, uh, okay, so, so that's a long example. I, th I think I fixed it in the next slide. Okay, so yes, this is the correct one, is that one book can have many chapters, but a chapter can only belong to one book, right? So think of a database which has a separate table for books and a separate table for the chapters. And now you might ask, why are we doing that? Because they're two separate things. Like you don't want a chapter to be a part of the book table because then is it going to be a column? Because if it's a column, then you have to define how many chapters that a book can have. But different books can have 
different numbers of chapters. So you don't want that to be the constraint. So the point is that if you have a, a book, you can have many chapters, but a chapter can be part of only one book. That's a one to many. Um, many to many is the thing that I talked about. You have a student that can take many courses, and a course can be taken by multiple students as well. So now we think about how do we design a database schema that models these three things. Um, and you see that they are fundamentally different. And this is like, you can think of it as an algorithm to model a database is that you first identify the relationships, then you identify which type they fall under. Then you basically just use your natural guess, which is what we'll come to. And my goal is to show you that it's super intuitive uh, when you understand what it really means. So if you have one to one, okay, it's a good database. Um, you can just have the car ID field and the owner ID field being stored in each other's data, uh, tables, right? So what I'm saying here is that for this car, this ID uh, uniquely identifies the car. But you also have that every car must have an owner ID because a car must be owned by exactly one person. And the same goes for, for the owner field. The owner must have a car ID that's a valid car. Does that make sense? But in practice, you, you would not store both. You would probably only store uh, the one that you care about. Like you don't need to store that the car is owned by this person and this person owns the car. They're both equivalent. So say you can get rid of this one and that's still okay. Because um, you still know that the car is owned by this guy, so it's fine. But the point is that you don't need a separate table to do this. There's no issues, there's no big issues with this. So this works fine. But this only works because a single car has a single owner and a single person can own a single car. Say you had a person that could own more than one car, um, how would you change this to adapt to that? So that's a question to think about. Say now you allow a person to own multiple cars. How would you change this design to account for that? Do you need a new data, uh, a new table, or can you just use these two? So you still have that a car is going to be owned by exactly one person, but a person can own multiple cars. Any thoughts on, on this one? Yes. Yes. So the key idea is that you don't know how many cars an owner can own, right? So you can't have this column being there because, well, you don't know if he has two cars or 20 cars, right? So you can't have the, this one be there. But you know for sure that a car is owned by exactly one person. So this is still enough to tell you who owns which car. So the point is, you don't need a new table when you're doing a one-to-many mapping as well. So we look at another example, which is you have books and chapters, which is something like this. Um, what this basically means is so this is the books table. The one at the bottom is the books one. The, the one at the top is the chapter one. This means there's a single book that we know of. It's called the Da Vinci Code. That is two chapters 
And we know that those chapters belong to the book because the book ID is the same as the ID of the book. Uh, what I mean to say is that for the books table, the ID column is the primary key, and here it's the foreign key because this value needs to come from a books table, the ID of a book. So you can think of it as you can't have a chapter that does not belong to a book. That should make sense, right? Any doubts on this so far? Okay, good. Now we look at the last one, which we actually saw already, is when you have many to many, you have no choice but to create a new table to combine these two things because, um, so you notice the key problem we have is with the many side. Say you have a book can have many chapters, so you can't store, store information about that in the books table simply because a book can have multiple chapters, right? But now we have student courses, um, which, um, so here's a concrete example of how this will um, feel like, right? So this is the student table with two people, me and Steve Jobs, um, taking two courses that are available. The first one is 2102, which is intro to databases. Second one is Steve Jobs' favorite one, calligraphy. Um, now it's possible for me to take both the courses, but Steve Jobs didn't like the code, so he only took the uh, calligraphy one. And this is how you would represent them. You have the ID one of a student taking a course of ID 2102, which is this course right here. Um, and the colors are such that you are looking from the perspective of a student. So you're trying to find out which student is taking which courses, right? So you see that Steve Jobs has ID 2, and he is taking a single course, which is calligraphy, right? And this makes perfect sense because um, that's how we structured the table, right? But the point is that you, that you don't have to think of it from the perspective of the student. You can also think of it from the perspective of the course. Who is taking this course? This course is taken by one person. And this information is given by the second column here, which is the course uh, ID. So if the course ID is the same, it means that the student is taking this same course. Um, the same goes for this one. It means that calligraphy is taken by um, two stu students whose IDs are one and two. Does that make sense? So my point is you should think of it from both the sides. They're, 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 they are symmetric in a sense that there's no role that is more important than the other. They're both equivalent, right? Okay, uh, so, so we take a short break here for about five minutes or so. Uh, so we, we would like to thank our sponsor, QRT, for providing us sponsorship for the snacks that you guys are eating. Uh, shout out to them. Here's a slide from them. Um, you can ch check it out here, I guess. Okay, so like we take a quick break. We'll be back at 7.45, where we'll go through examples and we'll actually write code to create the databases.
So you can think of it as one in Singapore has many cities in So you don't need it. It's equivalent. That's why I do this. Because you, you don't need that because it's the same as a person. But that's a good question. You, you should not have to. It's okay. Oh. It's okay. I guess I'll leave. Okay. Hi. Okay, I don't know if you guys have pen and paper because you're all CS students and you brought your laptops, but I guess you can use all like online tools to draw. So the point of this exercise is for you to get practice on how to think of problems in the real world being mapped to a database. Right? So we'll start in about a minute's time in chill a bit. Okay, so let's, um, so the thing that we're going to focus on now is trying to understand the requirements and trying to model that as a relationship, as a database, right? Um, <coughs> so this is the problem that we're given. So I want you to take a look at this and try to draw a rough sort of design on how you would try to structure this. Um, so I'll give you guys about five minutes to actually do this by yourself, because it's good practice to do. Um, you can just draw tables and write down the columns and stuff. Um, so you have users and notebooks, and each notebook has notes. If you have pen and paper, that's great. If you don't, you can use online tools. If you want an idea for an online tool, you can search this thing called Excalidraw. It's a free thing. It's called Excalidraw. I don't, I don't know if I'll get the spelling right. Uh, Excalidraw. I think it's quite nice to use. Um,
If you're stuck, you can talk to the person beside <coughs> you and talk about this. It's not it's not an assignment, you can just talk to people. Need help or something. Stop. I think the point of this is to get your thought process right, to learn how to think about it. Um, For now, like we don't really care about the format of how you draw it. Uh, it just needs to be understandable by you and the person you're trying to explain it to. But in practice, there are general um, sort of practices of how do you draw things. That's called an it's called an entity relationship diagram, which we will talk about briefly. But it's not as important as the name makes it sound. It's just a way of um, formalizing everything that you're going to draw. So we have someone trying to draw it on the board. So, so now, uh, what I think as a good like illustration, um, it's probably a good idea to look at something someone has drawn and see if it makes sense. What I mean by makes sense is, does this represent what you want, right? So let's go through it. Thank you for trying. I think it's a good attempt. Um, so. You notice that he has three tables here, user, notebook, and note. Oh, by the way, this was not scripted. We didn't plan this. He just did it, OK? Um, so a user has an email, username, and password. Um, so I'm assuming that the primary key will be the email. So 
you can choose to underline it to just represent that it's going to be the primary key. Um, so this part makes sense. Um, her notebook has a name and a description, right? Uh, yes. But how do we identify the notebook? So we don't know that yet, right? Because you can have two, two notebooks uh, that have the same name, same uh, description, that are owned by two different people. So you need some way to identify those two. And what we're going to do is we just have another field called ID, right? Like that seems reasonable. So now every notebook has an ID name description. So we could have also done this for uh, for a uh, user, but we don't have to because email is already unique, right? Like that's guaranteed by the email providers that we use. And then we have note. A note has a title and contents. Um, and, and again, we don't know if two notes can have the same title and content, right? So we need some way to distinguish between it. So we have something called an ID here as well. My point is, these three things now have entities, right? So these are all separate entities. We have a table for each of them. Now we come to the relationships, which is probably the hard part here. Um, so a user can own multiple notebooks. So he has put one to many, which is right. But this does not tell you how it's going to be stored. Um, this is similar to saying a book can have many chapters, right? So the same idea that we did, we can have every notebook having something called an owner ID, right? Does this make sense? You just tell the notebook that you are owned by this person. We can't put the notebook ID for the user because a user can have more than one notebook. So that won't work. But this works because a notebook is owned by a single person. OK, so now this uh, thing is fixed. Now we see that every note belongs to exactly one notebook. But a notebook can have many notes. The same idea for a note, we have something called a notebook. ID <coughs> that tells you which notebook the note uh, belongs to. Does that make sense? So, so, so you see here that we're not doing anything super hard. It's just trying to think about how do we model the um, relationships in the form of a table. Um, if you guys got something similar, that's great. If you didn't, that may also be right. There is more than uh, one way to create a database design. You're more than welcome to talk to me after class to sort of see if that makes sense as well. After the workshop, I don't know why I said class. On that. Okay, so just to go through it again, you first identify the nouns. Generally, these are going to be the tables. So here we have three nouns, users, notebooks, and notes. So those were the three tables that we have here. And then we identify the relationship between um, notebooks, notes, and users, notebooks, right? So we see here that, uh, Oh, OK, sorry. Before that, we also want to store uh, what information do we actually need to track. We see that for a user, we want to track the username, the email, and the password. For the notebooks, the name, the description. For the notes, the title, and the content. So that's why he drew this. Right? And then we identify the uh, relationships. and. This, um, usually, this is the 
hardest part, but I, I, I think we did it quite well in the sense that, that we know that a user can own multiple root books, so we want to track that. So we use some owner ID here. And each notebook belongs to exactly one user pair. And each note belongs to exactly one notebook. So we track that with a notebook ID here. Right? Uh, and then we draw it out. We put everything into a table. And we write some constraints. To be honest, not that important. It's the same thing as what we talked about. This is just saying that ID is the primary key here. And the email is going to be unique. Um, so the reason I said you don't need an ID is because email is going to be unique. Um, but ID is just convenient, I guess. And a notebook has an ID. And the creator ID, which here we call owner ID, is a foreign key. That means that. Um, the creator ID must be a value that's a valid value stored in the user's table. So a notebook cannot be owned by someone that does not exist. That's what it means. Right? The same thing for this one. A note, so you see that the notebook ID is a foreign key. That means that a note, uh, that a note belongs to a notebook ID that it must exist. So you must create a notebook before you create a, a note. Like, I think that should be intuitive. You can't have a notebook if you don't have a, a person that owns it. Right? H any questions on, on, on this part so far? Is it okay if yeah. you have two before you just to one? Yes, it's perfectly okay. Ooh. What are you thinking about, actually? Like, oh, no, I was just thinking if it's um, recommended to do so or it become very messy. I think it's perfectly OK to have two foreign keys. Generally, tables might have more than one. It's quite common. Because uh, relationships in the real world are generally complex. So you don't just have two parties that take place. Say you are a shipping company. Um, you might have an order table, you have a seller, you have a buyer. So then if you have a table, you will have this, this order belongs to this buyer and, and that's being sold by this person. So you have the buyer ID, seller ID, and even order ID being a point case. Yeah. Notebook ID. Yes, uh, th yes, yes, uh, let me, yes, so you're right, this is a typo. This should be UUID because the type of the foreign key must be the same as the type of the column it references. So the type of ID on the notebooks table is uh, UUID. So the type of the notebook ID here must be UUID, good catch. So yes, this is a typo. This should be changed. I have to go back and do that, I guess. OK. Um, so again, we model the relationships. I think we talked about this. I'm going to show it, show it the entire thing first, um, and then explain the notation. Basically, if you see a double line, which is this one, this means that uh, that you must have a notebook that is owned by a user, right? You cannot have a notebook that is not owned by a user, but one user can have more than one notebook. So we have the three lines thing, the same thing that we saw earlier. This is one to many. So one user can have many notebooks. But one notebook is owned by a single person. Same thing for notebooks and notes. A notebook has many notes, but a, notes of a note belongs to a single notebook. OK, 
Okay, now we get into the better stuff, which is the coding part. So I want you all to go to this link to find the code, which we will be using. So we'll go through it, and now is the time to go to Postgres and click Start Server if you have not already done so. Um, in general, it should ask for a port number. You can use the uh, default one. I think it's 5432. That's the default one that uh, Postgres will use. And you can also open PG admin on the side. Um, you need to connect to the server, so maybe it's a good idea if I also show it. So PG admin should look something like this. Oh, of course, you won't have all of this. Um, but you, you should see a server. I think this is enough. Can you kind of see this? Um, if I type something, oh wait, who have screens there as well? Yes, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, okay, so if you can't get to this sort of page, please tell us so we can come help you. So there are two steps here. Go to Postgres. Um, it should look something like this if you're on a Mac. You should see that the server is on, and it's on port 5432. Then you, um, when you go to PG admin, you will have to type the password and uh, username that you created the account with. Um, you probably won't have 16 databases. Um, but yeah, you should get a page that looks something like this. If you don't get this, please raise your hand, we'll come and help you out. Oh, so if you're at the databases page, um, you can create a new database. Okay. Is everyone following here? So you create a new database. I'm going to call it Hacker School. And click Save. And just to test whether everything works fine, what you want to do is click, you click here and you click on the query tool. Okay, so you, you click and you select the query tool, then you get this thing. Let me, uh, do it again. Okay, so you you click on the database that you have created. You have to right click, and then you click on the query tool. Is everyone there? Because I think it won't be fun if you guys don't try it out. So I really want to make sure that you're on the same thing. I think you can just, yeah. 
You can kind of leave it as blank as possible. Oh, okay. Uh, are you able to go with the query tool? Yes. Like, you can. No, no, so, okay. Can you click on data research? Oh, here. No, the one that the drop down. Okay. Who's that? Okay, so that's okay. Now, can you go to that and right click on who's that? And query tool. Okay, great. So, this is where you write the queries. Um, in general, most people that work on databases might not use this at all. They might just use the t terminal to do things, but we don't want to get into that. So we use a nice interface for it. Yeah. Right. So you have PG admin, right? Yeah. So, okay. no, so this is MySQL, right? So now we're doing PostgreSQL. PSQL. Right? So if you want to use the terminal, if you are a PR. Can you switch it on Google and see what you should put? Uh, I, the no, just Google it and just see if you can find the answer online. Okay. Ooh, the default password is generally MX. MX. If it's not MX, it's probably nothing. It's generally, I don't know why it's called MX. Does it work? We will go through it together, so we, yeah. no, no, it's fine, you can just do it. There's no question. Okay, um, if you still need help, um, you can raise your hand and a uh, nice person appear if you think they need help. Both of them. Okay, but in the meantime, I guess we can get started. I think most of us have set it up. So what we're going to do is exactly what we um, sort of did in the last 30-ish minutes. Um, so if you go to this link, you should be directed to a page which has all the code that we're going to use. Um, the point of this is so that we don't focus on things like the syntax, but we get to focus on how things work. How do you use these things? Okay, so the first thing that we are going to do is to create the tables. So just how we created um, the database design, the schema, we will create the table. Um, and the syntax for this um, is create table, the thing, then you give the name of the table that you want. So here it's users and notebooks. Then you give the name of the column, which is ID, the type, which is serial. Serial just means that you auto increment. So if you don't include the number, it will auto increment for you. So you don't want to manually key in the ID of a user. You want that to be automatically generated for you. So you can use serial. It's basically an integer. And then you say that, OK, look, this column is the primary key. And then you have the other columns, which is email, username, and the password hash. Um, so you might ask, why don't we store the password 
and we saw the password hash. That's because passwords should never be stored in the database because your database is not protected. You never want to store your password directly in um, the database. That's the bottom line because your database can be hacked, but you don't want passwords to be leaked. So you store a password hash, which is just, you have a password, you put it through a hash function, and you get a password hash. And the same thing we do for the notebooks table. We have ID, which is a serial, which basically means it's an integer that will auto-increment. You have the name, the description, and now you have two more things, which is created at, created by. This basically means that you want to track at what time were these notebooks created. Now that might be important, that might not be important. Here, you assume it is important and you do want to track it. And here is the important thing. Foreign key created by references user's ID. This means a user, okay, so the created by is the owner ID here, right? So this must have a value that corresponds to some valid user whose ID must match the uh, created by. So you can't have a notebook whose owner is not in the user's table. So this, this is going to be enforced by Postgres. This will draw the line for you between user and uh, a notebook. So this is done for you automatically. You just have to specify that the foreign key is created by, which references the ID column of the user's table. Does, does that make sense? So the syntax might be a bit haunting, um, but think of it as the column name and the type then you have other options that you like to include. Like, is it going to be unique? Is it the primary key? And so on. Right? Um, so let's just, OK, so it's, it's enough talk. Time to code it out. Um, so let me copy the first two and go to PG admin and paste it. Um, and to execute the code, if you are on a Windows Laptop, you can click F5, but I'm on a Mac, so unfortunately I have to manually go and click Run over here. And you should see that create table query returned successfully. Right? This means that Postgres has created the tables for you. Did everyone execute the first two so far? Again, if anyone is stuck or the query fails for some strange reason, please do ask us. Okay, great. Um, you 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 notice that I sneakily added in a few things. The first thing that I added is if not exists. Uh, this was not in the slides, but I put it here because if you don't have this and you try to run the same code twice, Postgres will complain saying that you already have a table by this name. So what you're saying is you want to create a table if it does not exist. But if it does exist, just skip it. Don't tell me I'm wrong. So now if I execute this again, create table, there's an error. Yeah, so this returns fine. So it just tells you that it already exists, so I'm going to skip it. But if you didn't have the if not exist, it would throw an error. For example, I can just show you. 
by deleting this and I execute this it will throw an error and we don't want that okay now we're going to look at the third table which is notes a note looks very similar to a notebook it has an ID it has a title content and again the important thing here is like the interesting thing here is the notebook ID that's an integer which references notebooks so here we then specify the exact column of which this references so the default is the primary key of the notebooks column which happens to be ID um, so my point is if you notice here we wrote this line to create a foreign key between created by and user's ID. But in the next slide, we don't do that. We simply write this references this. Both are equally right. I'm just trying to show you two different ways of achieving the same thing. Right? So I'm going to copy this code, uh, possibly from here. And I am going to put it here and I'm going to run and you see that the first two already exist so it skips it and the third one is created. Okay so now we have created all our tables. Is everyone okay so far? Okay, so I see two people are stuck but apart from them is everyone okay? Okay nice. It's all good. Okay. Um, okay. So now we have our tables, but it's kind of sad because we don't have any data in our tables yet. Like our tables are empty. Um, so let's go ahead and add data to our table. So so I want you to go to this thing called insert dot SQL, and I want you to copy this entire thing. So you should see. 15 ish rows copy and you can just paste it at the bottom or you can just delete this because you've already created the tables and you want to run all of them okay i think this i think if you get an error um that should not happen let's try to fix it uh Actually, I don't think it's an error. It's it's just uh, so what I'm trying to do is check if there's any error or not, and I notice there there is an error. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to manually insert each one of them. This can't give an error because the table is empty, and let's execute the next three of them separately like this and it's all fine uh, let's comment this out now we can insert the values into notebook and notes so the syntax looks something like this you want to insert into the table the notebooks these are the columns and these are the values. Um, so I'm trying not to focus on the syntax because you can learn that by yourself and also because it's quite intuitive, right? It tells you, you want to insert into this table, these are the columns and these are the values. Does that make sense? It should not be too complicated. The only interesting thing here is we're calling the function now which says we are creating this notebook at this time, right? So now just returns the time that's now, like the, the current time. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we have data and we have tables. Now is the fun part where we actually try to do cool stuff with what we have. Um, so don't try 
to execute this twice if you do it will th throw an error oh it didn't throw an error okay then then it's quite bad but okay that's sad uh, okay now we want to sort of see the data that we have right so we're gonna look at basic ways to read data so the first thing is select and then you specify which columns you want to select um, star just means that you want to select all the columns from which table say I want to look at the users table I run and this tells me at, at, at the bottom here that the users table has four users the four users have these values can everyone execute that just to test if the data has been inserted right? Is anyone facing difficulty in trying to insert the data? Oh, like the empty line. I I think I turned it on just to. Oh, okay, I have no idea to be honest. So, so one of the, the, one of the, the G's is to verify everything in the data. It's to insert the data, yes. The first one? The first one is to create the tables, and then you go to insert.sql that just is to import the data, yes. Yes. So, okay, so what this means is you're trying to insert this in the notebooks table. So you're trying to assign a notebook to the first user, but the first user does not exist. So what, how, yeah, because you didn't insert this in the Okay, so let's try to fix this. Um, okay, you can actually write that exact same thing and try it to execute it, see what you get. I, I think it's going to be empty. No, 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 just, I think the line over there, select star from user. So th that will basically tell you what rows are there in the user's ta table. Now you run. Oh, okay, you do one again. Let's comment. Comment out. Okay, so you have only inserted two things. So the first pool bracket has not been inserted. So that's uncommon. No, like yeah. Okay, so you can insert it like this. There you go. But Z, but this is string. Let's try to execute it again. Oh, there you go. So you have one, two, three, four. Now, if you execute the rest of the things, it, it, yeah, it'll be fine. Okay, anyone else having issues? Because now is where we actually do interesting things. Now is where we figure out who owns which notebooks and things like that. Okay. The next thing we want to do is say you want to select the user. Um, with a specific kind of name, say, where username equals user1, say. So what this is doing is you are selecting from a table with a specific condition. So it's, um, you can think of it as almost being, a, it's almost English, right? Select star from users where the username is user1 basically means 
uh, give me the data belonging to the user one. And when I run this, it will give me two people because two people have the same username. And that's what I was talking about when I said that's why you need an ID field to identify them. OK, so I just showed you how to filter data based on a condition. Right? Let's look at another interesting thing. You can do two of them. You can do something like, say, say you want to do, um, and the email is <coughs> user1example.com. This will only give you the first person because um, you need both the clauses to be true, which means you need the username to be this and the email to be this. So you need both of them to be true for the row to be up to date. OK, we can, we can also do interesting things. Because this is a string, you can do something like where the email is like something, say you want, um, uh, say you want to get all the users whose email ends with something, uh, um, something followed by example.com, right? So I can do something like where email like, I think it's star example.com. You know, it's not star, is it? Question mark? Uh, where email like, I thought it's star. Mm. Give me a second. What's the syntax for where you want to get all the things that look like? Underscore. Underscore is for a single character, right? And then colon if it's multiple. It colon something. Oh, sorry, percentage sign. Percentage sign, OK, yes. Yes, so you get everything that looks of the form something at example.com, right? So this is quite cool. Now we focus on um, this is the true power of a uh, database is that you have organized your data in such a way that you can execute such things very fast. So the percentage sign means it can be any character. Um, and then we want the email to be of the form something at example.com. Okay? Um, but that's still not enough fun because we want to see how things work with multiple uh, tab tables. So let's look um, at something like this. Uh, and what this is doing <coughs> is we want to find which users created which notebooks. And for that, we use the keyword join to join two tables, but for them to join and still make sense, you have to specify which column to join on. So it's, this is basically saying, you want to join these users with the notebooks where the created, uh, where the ID of the user matches the created by column for the notebook. So this will give you who created which notebook. So you, you can see here that User one created one, two, three, four notebooks. User two created two of them. I don't know if there are more. It should not be, right? Yeah. Um, so the point here is that you, that you can use the word join to, to, to do this. OK, now an exercise is to write code um, that prints out all the notes belonging to all the notebooks. So here we printed out the notebooks belonging to the users. 
Now we want to create a, a query that can print out which notes belongs to which notebooks. So very similar to this. I'll give you about a minute to do this. For those that are still doing, let me also start helping you guys out. So we want to. So the goal is. Um, okay. By the way, dash dash is to write a comment. So we want to print out <coughs> the notes uh, belonging to all the notebooks. So very similar. We want to print out. Um, Say we do notebooks dot star, and we want to also print out all the notes. So it's called notes from notebooks. You want to join on the note table, and the join column is um, notebooks dot id is equals to note dot. I think it's called notebook id. I don't know what I named it. Notebook ID, yeah. And hopefully this works. Okay, uh, it's notes. This is also notes. This is also notes. And there you go. We have successfully gotten all the notes belonging to all the notebooks. Does everyone get this? So we're trying to combine data from different tables. And what this is saying is you want to print out all the columns of notebooks. You want to print out all the columns of notes. You want to join the tables based on the common um, sort of field, which is the, note, the notebooks dot ID must match the notes notebook ID. Because that's how we define that the note belongs to the notebook. Right? Does everyone get this so far? We're joining two tables. Um, and then again, try, try to think about how hard this would be to do it for two random files. You can't just run such a statement to merge data from different files. Right? <coughs> Okay, um, let's see what we have next. Uh, I think. Um, okay, so you can do quite a few different things, right? Okay, say say now you want to get all the notebooks belonging to user one, where so basically the ID is one. How would you do this? This will make use of the things that you did here and here. So I'll give you guys about a minute to think about this as well. So you want to get the notebooks that not belong to all the users, but just the user one. Do you want to try to write query for this one? And again, this is not scripted, I promise you. He had no idea he was going to be asked to do this. He happened to be there. <coughs> Get. <laughs> he's trolling at this point. As you can see, he's stressed out. And as he should be. <laughs> Oh, by the way, just FYI, MSQL is not case sensitive. 
That means it doesn't matter if the select is capital or not. Um, <clears throat> but we put it in capital just so that um, we know that that's a keyword. So you can try to put it in lowercase, and it wouldn't do any errors. What's, what's, the, what's the user ID? Uh, U dot ID. U dot ID is equal to. Mm -hmm. You don't know. No, what's the what's the foreign key? Uh, I don't know the key. Created key. by n dot created by. So this will give you all the notebooks for all the users. But now you want to. Uh, filter by user one. So he's going to add a where clause where the user ID should be exactly one. And there you go, you get the four notebooks that were created by user one. Um, yeah, that seems about right. Say you also want to say you also want to get the information about the user, you would do something like this, and you get all the information that you need, right? You get the notebooks, the users, you merge them, and you merge them based on the column that must be the same for both of them, which is ID and uh, created by. But you only want those uh, notebooks with the ID one. Does everyone get this? So I don't expect you to be able to code this up so fast. That's not the point. The point is, can you understand what this code is trying to do? <coughs> and sorry, my voice is dead because I have a sore throat. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I should sound that bad. Okay. Okay. So now we have the next thing. Let's try to do another one just for practice. So I just wanna. Um, ah, okay, so, uh, wait, so let's try to do two more things, right? Let's try to count how many notebooks does user ID equal to one have, right? This is something that we want to do. Okay, now you might just say, well, uh, you can see it's four, right? But we want the program to tell us the number four. Because this could easily be a million, but we really want to know the number. So we use this thing called count. So I can do something like, I can write the same thing, but I just care about the count. So I just want count star, and this should tell me just the number four. So this is a predefined function called count, which just counts the rows in the output, right? Okay, but this is still not good because we have to do this one at a time for each user. So now he is going to code out how many notebooks does each user have, not just user ID one, but in a single query, can you tell me how many notebooks uh, each you, um, person has? So this will make use of a special thing that we have not seen so far called group by. So you want to group all the um, rows with the same user ID, right? You want to count the number of rows belonging to each user ID. Um, okay, so you first join everything, so the first part stays the same. The only difference is at the end, you have to group the rows by the user ID. Okay, so this will 
live an error. Oh, it does not. Okay, good. So, but you don't know which user it belongs to. So you also want to output the user ID. There you go. So now you are told this user ID has two notebooks. User one has four notebooks. Okay. Now I want you to do the same thing, but find out um, how many notes are in each notebook. So here we did the same thing for how many notebooks does a user have. Now I want you to do how many notes are in each notebook. So I'll give you guys about a minute to do this, then uh, he will write the solution to that. This is great. We should, we should always do this. Terror. <laughs> 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 Um, the link is here. Uh, you can go to that link there. If, if, if you have coded out the solution and you would like to try to do it live again, you're more than welcome to come here and do it. So the question is, Find out how many notes belong to each notebook. So this slide is only there for him to copy the link. I think he's done it. Let's move on to back here. You want to count how many notes are in each notebook. I'm assuming you've tried it. OK, let me sort of explain this step by step as well. The first thing that you want to know is you have two tables that you need, notes and notebook. So you want to do, a, okay, I'm going to stick to cap, uh, capital case for the keywords. Um, select star from notebooks and you want to join with the notes. <coughs> on this one where okay this should just you want to select star from the notebooks on this thing so th this will just give you everything right now you want to group by um, notebooks dot id Okay, so basically, and then you want to print out how many rows appear, right? Something like this, which tells you that notebook one has four notes, notebook two has two notes. You can check this out if you just remove this and remove the group by, and you just run this. You can actually count that notebook one has four notes and notebook two has two notes, right? So again, just to recap, um, <coughs> we wrote this and then we wanted to group by notebooks ID. And what this is basically doing is you want to group all the notebooks with the same ID and count how many rows are there. And you want to print both of them out. So this means notebook two has two notes and one has four notes. Okay, now, <coughs> say you forgot to add a column when you created the database. You can actually just go to halter, okay, where is it? Okay, it's not there, but I think, Okay, now we're going to try and update the data, right? 
Um, when you have data, you can oh, you can also update it. So let's <coughs> let's look at the data from the users table. Um, what I want to do is change the email of user one to be devansh at nushackers.org. Okay, this is what I want to do. How I go about doing it is you write this keyword called update and then the table and then the table name. Here it's going to be update users. Then you want to set a value. So set the, the email to be equal to the new email. But you don't want this to be for all the users, just for the one with user ID is equal to one. Right? Um, so this should have successfully updated it. So the key, and now we can select star again. I think it's going to just come. OK, so this will, oh, OK, now we have the email has been updated. Did, did everyone get that? So we're making use of two new things. The first one is update. The keyword update means that you want to update a table. Then you set the value of the column to be this, where this is true. OK, now I want to do something different. I want to, how do I make life hard? OK, um, okay. say I want to delete everyone. Okay, no, no, no. Um, we'll we'll do that at the end. Um, say you want to add um, the password hash to the username for everyone. So you want to change everyone's username to be the current username plus the password hash. So username for the first one will be user one hash one. The second one will be user two hash two. So I'll give you guys about a minute to do to do this. Um, think about how you would do this. It's going to be very similar to the first one, but you don't even need a where clause because you want to do this for everyone. So you want to to update table users set something to be something, that's it. Can you guys try this one? If you have any thoughts, you can just think about it. Okay, I see some of you got it. So the solution would look something like this. It's very similar to the, the one above. You want to update users, set the username to be equal to the username plus the password hash, and that's it. Yeah, you don't need that. Run this. Uh, okay, so you will encounter this thing. Plus does not exist. Uh, you can use the concatenate. I don't know. I think concatenate. Is what? Sorry? It's just concat. Concat. Yeah. Uh, concat. No, if you don't know concat, you can just use the. What? The thing? This works. Okay. Tr 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 it's always at the or the top of it. Yeah. It, no, this is not, not equal to. Okay, so okay, so when you're working with databases, no, wait, wait, so this is a great time to explain wait. something. Um, when you execute code that is wrong, you will forever change it. Now I can't go back. Um, and I'll show you how to go back. Right? Okay.
What is the term? Right, right. So when you're not sure about things, it's fine. But don't delete stuff if you're not sure about it. It's okay to update because now I'm going to just, so it's a good example, right? I want to update users where I want to set the username to be the concatenation of, okay, this should, uh, the user, the ID uh, or the string user and the ID. <coughs> I hope this is an actual function. It is, it is. Um, users are ID. No, I think the issue is here. Uh, I think concat is a function. Is it a function? <coughs> this is probably why most people don't code live because you can run into issues like this. But it's way more fun, I guess. Um, username. Okay. So the syntax looks something like this. You want to concatenate this with the ID. Um, hopefully, this works. Let's try it out. There you go, we got back our users. <laughs> Thank God. Thank you. Thank you. Point being, if you update things, it can go wrong. Thankfully, we didn't try something too crazy. Um, yeah. So now we want to do the same for the username to be the concatenation of the user and the password. Um, and as you can see, like even I don't know the syntax for stuff like how do you concatenate two things, which is perfectly fine because you can always Google it up, right? The point is to understand how these things work, and that's basically it. So you can Google syntax. You can't Google concepts. It's harder, I guess. Um, so yes, there we have done it. So we know how to update things. The final thing is how do you delete stuff which you should be careful of. Um, and the reason why you should be careful is this, which I'll show you now, is say you want to delete everyone that does not belong to NUS hackers. So you want to delete everyone that does not have an email that ends with NUS hackers.org. If you try to do this, um, Postgres will stop you and the reason is you have notebooks that belong to these poor people that you're about to destroy from the face of the database. So if you try to do it, um, yep, delete from users where the email is not like this form. You just want to kill them off. Postgres will say, nope, that's not allowed. Where email is not like, oh, uh, that's <laughs> Uh, at nushackers.org. Um, Postgres should complain, saying no. Why? Because this violates a foreign key constraints notebooks created by. Basically, this whole thing means you have notebooks that belong to people you're trying to delete. You have to specify how you want this to be handled but we did not when we created the table. So now we have to delete the notebooks of the users first before we delete the users. And this is great because Postgres will not allow you to kill off people who have data that's in your database. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's a great point, right? So when we created the table at the very top, okay, I don't think I have the code here, but we did not specify how to handle deletes. By default, Postgres will stop you, right? So the last thing that, uh, that I want to show you is how do you actually delete things is you must delete in the right order. So you delete the notes first. You can't even delete the notebooks because the notebooks have notes associated with them. You can't destroy a notebook with notes in it. So, uh, so you want to delete the notes first. 
So what we're going to do is um, delete from notes where uh, ha ha. So now we're stuck because notes does not know who owns it. So there's no way to figure that out. But again, there's an easy way to fix this. If you join notebooks, notes, users. So we're going to do a final query that deletes the notes that belong to user one and two. Does everyone see the problem here? The problem is we're trying to delete notes, but notes does not know who is user one and two. Notes only knows which notebook it belongs to. The notebook knows which user it belongs to. So we have to join all of them, which he's going to do, I guess. <coughs> So we're going to delete the notes belonging to user 1 and uh, to everyone that does not have an email that ends with any of hackers.org. Join, right? Join. Delete the notes first, right? Yeah, you want to delete the notes. Wait, is email or you want user ID? Email. User's email. Uh, users. Okay, the spelling of users. Yeah. Okay. So he's just going to check first. So you get the right data. You want to delete the two nodes by user two. So you recall that I'm user one. User two is a guy with two nodes. You want to delete both these things. Right? Uh, let's try. Oh, you can't delete while joining. So, ah, okay, I guess I can. I don't think you can join, you can delete from a join, right? Oh. Wait, so, okay, wait. Uh, let's. Oh, okay, so. Let me try to explain this. You want, okay, so, so far, does everyone get this part? This will give you notes belonging to users who don't have an email of the form uh, .org, right? You have joined on both the tables because you need information from all of them. But this does not tell you uh, you can't delete uh, on a join. So what I'm going to do is something like this. You want to delete um, from notes where the ID, uh, notes.id is, uh, is in a certain list, right? And the list is going to be given by this. So this is called a nested query, which I was not expecting to use, but I just came up with the problem that happened to use it. Um, and you only want to select notes.id. Uh, so does everyone get the thing that we're trying to do here? This will give us the notes. This will give, give us just the ID of the notes that we want to delete. And this will delete the notes where this ID falls falls in this range, like falls in this list. Okay, this part is complicated, so I don't expect um, like you completely get it. But I hope you appreciate um, what we're trying to do is not that simple, but my point is you can do it. You can link multiple tables and still work. So this, I'm praying it works. Um, Oh, thank God. Okay, so you have successfully deleted the notes. If I select star from notes, I should only have um, notes belonging to user one 
as you can see, they all belong to notebook one, which is created by user one. Now, I want to do the same thing, but for notebooks, I want to delete from uh, notebooks where uh, notebooks dot created by is in this list of people that we don't like. So we don't like people uh, whose email addresses are not like something at nushackers.org. Does this make sense? It's the same thing. It's even easier now because we only have two tables that we care about. Um, let's execute this. We deleted the notebooks belonging. So let's select star from notebooks. And we are left with only notebooks that are created by user one. Now and now only you can delete off the users. So, um, and now Postgres will not complain. So now you are free to do delete from users where users the where the email is not like the things that uh, we don't like and this will now work because there is no associated data with the people that we're trying to kill off so now if we execute this this should give me just me. Does this make sense? We are forced to delete in a specific order because we told Postgres that we want to maintain this um, relationship, but we tried to violate that, so Postgres stopped us from making a, a blunder because you don't want to have people that are killed off who have notebooks and learning. And I think this is a good way to end the session because it, it, it explains a lot of the nuances. Um, and if I go back to the slides, <coughs> um, so the code is there all in the gist and the slides. Um, the key takeaway you should have from this is not really the syntax but it's more about how you think of databases and tables. Um, but don't try to use tables for everything. Sometimes you might want to use the document structures or graph structures, not table-based um, structures. And another important thing is these are some of the best practices. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, th I think many people do that. It's not advisable. Um, you don't want to have a list of objects inside a single cell. Um, but in practice, many companies also do that for efficiency purposes. Um, so you serialize the data and you store it as a string or a JSON, it's all fine. But in general, we don't like doing that because Postgres can't help us anymore because Postgres, um, from Postgres's point of view, that's a single object. So it, it doesn't know that it's composed of many different things that to you are different. Postgres just sees it as a whole big object. Yeah, so it doesn't really do it just takes your identity. Yeah. Yeah. Use it as a JSON to that time. Yes. So already you were like, so how functions you just put it inside. Yes, so so there are functions that let you do that. My point is it's not always advisable to do that because you lose the checks that are guaranteed by Postgres. So you have to impose them manually then. I hope that answers.
Let's just go through this first. Um, so we have covered a lot of things, but we did not talk about a lot more. Um, these are all the things that you can read up about. It's super cool. Databases is a vast thing. Is this hopefully is just to get you excited about it? It's not really to sort of teach you the syntax because I think that's something you can learn. It's it's much harder to think about how to think about tables and how to design a schema from scratch, which you guys did, which is great. Um, these are topics you can learn more about. And I think that's it. That's all for today. Thank you for coming. Um, do we have a feedback form? Oh, it? yeah, we do. We do it too. No? And let yeah, let me, let me just... Okay, so if you have a feedback form, I would appreciate it if just wait a minute. Do you have it. the link? I think it's under the link. Like the flan, the Excel. Right. No, Excel, the sheet. Forgot about that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can go to my telegram and just... Uh, just enter it here, you want? Yeah, you can just... Is it a link? Yeah, yeah. you can just add, add the link here. Um, so if you could please, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. If you could go to this link and submit the feedback, that would be great for us to know how we can do better. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Um, also, another thing is, um, maybe related, I'm not sure, is just to gauge interest, right? So we're planning to create a page to upload all the resources that we have in our like, workshops and like Friday hacks and everything that we've been doing in the past like, five years ish. Um, do you think that'll be useful? I like if we think that'll be useful. Um, we just want to know your thoughts on it. So if you want to talk about it, you can come to me after this. Yes, I can talk about it. Um, so, so the point is that we have all these slides already made, but people don't know about it. So we just want that to put it on a page so that people can access it. Um, yeah. Separate them based on uh, and then, yeah, like yeah. Ooh, okay, sure. Like the topics, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I think that makes sense. I also I think it'll be hard to navigate them, but we're going to like find it more easy. That's true. I think we can have a search bar. Maybe we can search. Uh, I'm not using topic. Topic, sorry. Elasticsearch. Um, I'm planning to just use a simple page to upload everything so you can search. You can just find stuff. Uh, yeah. You can also put hashtags. Yeah, so yeah. tag is the thing that I'm planning to do, like Friday hacks is a tag and so on. So if you just want to focus on talks, you can just watch videos and stuff. Tags for the topics might be, I'm hesitant because there are some like, talks that we have that don't really have an associated topic. It's hard to classify. You know, they have a topic, it's hard to classify them. Is it like more basic? <coughs> no, it's actually more niche things. Like say there's a single talk, quantum computing. Then put it on the quantum computer. But there'll be a new tag, so there'll be too many tags. There's the same issue as it's kind of many tags. So you want a small number of maybe 20-ish tags. Yeah. So I'm just going to think about how best to structure this. So I'm going to be that as well. The plan is to get it done in the back of this set, which should not be too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, you are free to leave if you don't have doubts. Um, hope you had fun and ooh, <coughs> tomorrow there's a Friday hack. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you can.
Oh my god, are you okay? Ayo. Yeah, yeah, so the, the Friday Hacks details are here. Eh. So, Alright. It's here, it's here. Uh, we have some cool technical talks this week. So it's about it's these uh, two. on music and sing and time synchronization. So NTP. I'm not sure. We will see ya. Uh, oh, I, I guess there's one of them. But maybe there's one of them. Maybe there's one of them. I think it's more like a higher level. But we'll see. I'm not sure why it's just more complicated to like post and speech. Other than that, it's just like a first level. I guess I'm just saying. Alright. Oh, and, and we do still have some snacks left over if you guys want. Yeah, just grab it. I think this is. Uh, no. Sorry, I'm going to stop the recording real quick. Most languages 